guide our thoughts, be with those who are trying to connect and may have difficulties, and above all, that your Holy Spirit may affirm your grace and your goodness to us as we gather. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, good to see you all as we talk about leadership. And today, I want to focus on the subject of influence. Last week, I asked a question for homework, which I don't know whether you had a time to look at. The question was, what makes it difficult in our African context to practice servant leadership? So I hope you will be able to wrestle with that and be able to learn as you discuss together as a group. But for today, we move to the question of influence for leaders. We are thinking about biblical leadership. We are thinking about how to create an impact. And my hope and my prayer is that as we gather and look at this subject, we will learn some truths that will be of benefit to us. For the first section, I had prepared some case study from the book of Philippians. And I will not necessarily go through it because of time, but I hope that when you get the slides, you can work through the book of Philippians to see how the church in Philippi was able to influence and transform this community in Macedonia, Europe, as we know it today, when the gospel of Christ came. It took a very decisive, clear, visionary leadership to make the difference in Macedonia and specifically in the city of Philippi. So as Paul wrote this epistle, the book of Philippians, that is a wonderful book in the New Testament, I borrowed from chapter one and two in that case study that you'll have an opportunity to see at least 12 characteristics of leadership that are key to your fellowship or to your church or to your community. So I hope that you will embrace them and take them to heart so that through them, you can be able to apply it in your own situation and ask yourself, how can I bring a godly influence through these 12 qualities? As I said, because of time, I will not go into that, but it's in the first section of the slides that we are looking at. So allow me to join the slides at section two after the case study that could have easily taken 10 to 15 minutes of our time, but we are working with limited time. And so I won't go into it, but it's a very wonderful thing to notice that every Christian leadership is grounded in the scriptures. It has God's word, God's affirmation, and it is clothed in prayer to make a difference. So friends, as you follow, think about your own life. How are you creating impact, influence, and transformation through your leadership where you are? So allow me to now join our slides at uh, section two, which is uh, somewhere along the way. And I'll share my screen as we think about this next section two, which I have called the Zafis Campus Fellowship, but I know that for those who are joining for Botswana, it's your ICMB, and for those who may be following from other parts of the world, you can think about your own fellowship, but if you are an associate, think about your church or your community. So though I may have called it Zafes because it's specific to Zafes, I hope that you will think about your own situation. Now, to start with, in your own fellowship, as we think about leadership, there are three quick issues that are important. First of all is vision, and we looked at that quite a bit in our first session. The second one is mission, and the third one are your aims. Now, when it comes to vision, it's a picture of where you want to get. By God's grace, God's help, where 
do you want to get to? What is the end result of your leadership? Mission is what makes it take place or happen. So for students who are on campus and for even those of us who are associates and part of our church, but specifically for students, the main task of student ministry is to equip Christian students to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ, meaning that they are being formed in the character and likeness of Jesus Christ so that they themselves can make disciples of other students by introducing the, Jesus, the gospel of Christ to them and bring it, bringing about a transformational effect in church and society as these students are graduated from the colleges. The mission, therefore, while on campus, is to bear witness to Jesus Christ so that those who have not yet known him personally and responded in obedience to him may come to know him. And therefore, in our fellowships, broadly, there are usually three, four, or maybe five major aims. First of all is evangelism, which means to bear witness to Christ. Secondly is discipleship, which is nurturing these new believers to grow towards maturity in Christ. Thirdly, for Zambia, I believe it's community where you are helping people to become part of God's family, the church, the body of Christ. And fourthly, it's mission, being able to translate our life to bring a holistic or integral uh, change in society through not only our proclamation or our witness, but also the demonstration of how the gospel changes lives. So those are the broad things, aims of the fellowship that we are all working towards. Now, as we think about leadership and influence, which is the topic for today, influence, leadership as influence, I want you to, to uh, I want to share with you some practical tips that will help you as you serve in any leadership role, whether in, the university or whether you are in church so the three questions that are important broadly speaking for us as you come to any group where you are going to be providing leadership first of all you need to ask yourself what are the attitudes the skills or the people or, or the knowledge that people you are working with have. Every group of people has certain attitudes, skills, or knowledge. It's important that as a leader, you do a needs assessment to understand where people are if you want to bring impact. The second question that you need to be asking yourself are what are the spiritual, social, academic, if they are students, if they are not students, it's the vocational needs, and fourthly, the financial needs. These are important questions because they will help you understand how you can relevantly engage with the people you are leading. So what are the spiritual, social, academic, stroke, vocational, or financial needs of the groups you're working with? And thirdly, the question you need to ask, how can we meet these needs? Leadership is, is actually responding to the needs that is responding to the needs uh, of the people you are leading. That's what leadership is about, is providing solutions to the people you are leading so that you can meet their needs in every dimension of our humanity as we saw last week. So as we, having asked those questions that helps you understand the need of the places, whether it's the fellowship of the church, where you're working and how you want to bring about change. I want to emphasize in this fourth section, remember we started at section two, three, and now four, the first section I've left for you to do some Bible study on qualities for leadership found in the church in Philippi. Now, it's important for me to emphasize that for an effective functioning of a fellowship, the leadership has to clothe all its activities 
in prayer. Prayer is central to the plan and life of every fellowship. Now, these uh, qualities for us Christians can actually be taken to the workplace or even our communities where we work. So we pray to ask God for wisdom, even as secondly, we plan. Prayer is not an excuse not to plan. And planning is not done at the expense of prayer. We are Christians. We are depending on God. God has given us intellect. He has given us capacity to be creative and to think because the mind that God has given us is a gift created in the image and likeness of his. So as we come to lead, remember, we want to provide influence wherever we are. We pray, but secondly, we plan. Now, what does planning actually look like? For many of us who are coming into leadership for the very first time at campus level, you may not have had many, much experience in the area of planning. The Bible is full of planning. God is a God who is strategic because planning is about being strategic. Think about the story of creation. When God created the universe, he created the vegetation before he created the animals. That's strategy, that's plan. If God created the animals without a plan, he would have wondered what will the animals have eaten. But God created everything wonderfully. He created the earth before he brought the animals into being. So part of our Christian heritage created in God's image is that we plan because God is a God of order. So let's, let me talk about the planning cycle, which is something used in business uh, cycles and every organization that really wants to bring an impact. And I want to commend to you as children of God in our campuses and in our churches. These are tools that you can adopt and use so that you can be effective. What does the planning cycle, cycle involve? It has six major steps. In some models, there are only five, and in others, there could be more. But I'm using this particular model that has six steps. And I just want to highlight the six steps uh, uh, you know, quite briefly. The first one is going back to the questions that we had already asked, is the question of assessment. Christians, sometimes we are poor in taking stock of where we are. When you are put or thrust into a leadership role, I have been in many leadership roles over my life. And at every point, when you get into a leadership role, it's important for you to assess, number one, where are we now as a fellowship, as a church, as an organization? What are we doing? Why are we doing it? You need to ask yourself those questions because sometimes we do things because they have always been done without understanding why they are being done. And once we understand why they are being done, it helps us to be more strategic, more intentional and more purposeful. So after doing the first step of assessment, the second step, you need to understand what are the aims and objectives. Sometimes on our campus, we understand that yes, we are Christian Union Fellowship or we are Christian Fellowship, a CF, or we are an ICMB group or we are Zafes group or in Zimbabwe, you would be a focus group. But we don't as leaders know even our aims. We don't even know our objectives. Do you know in many of our systems in school, we get placed into the education system and some of us have never asked ourselves, why are we actually going to school? Have you ever stopped to ask yourself, why are you going to school? Some of us are in school because your parents made you go to school. And so you have gone through life being moved from one year to another without critically asking yourself, why do you actually go to school? So aims and objectives help clarify to us why where we exist and where do we want to go and why do we want to go there? 
Let me tell you that if you are a leader, whether the chairperson, the secretary, the organizing secretary, the treasurer, if you are a leader who does not know the aims and the objectives of the fellowship, or if it's a church or a community group or a class fellowship, you will not be effective or as effective as you would be if you understood the aims and objectives. The aims and objectives help you put your energies to maximize your returns. Last week, I told us that some, some of us want to be in everything that is there to be in. You call a subcommittee for something, you are there. You are in every fellowship on campus. Let me tell you, if that's your life, you'll die young because as a human being, you can't do everything. You need to understand your aims and objectives. And first of all, as a fellowship on campus, God has placed you there for those two, three, or four years as an ambassador of Christ, that if you do all it takes to help your campus know Jesus, you will have achieved something that is worth heaven rejoicing about. Because you will not be on that campus for the rest of your life. Some of us are students and we are on campus, but we are so restless that we spend all our time outside campus, reaching marketplaces, all other communities. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't you realize that God has called you on campus for a season so that you can be salt and light and that once you have finished, you will be equipped to come out into the larger society to remain a transformational agent. So the second aspect in the planning cycle that you need to sit down as a committee is to understand your aims and the objectives. The third step in any planning cycle, and this could apply to your own academics, you can adapt this to your own studies, or if you're in the workplace, your own job. You need to measure. How will we know when we get there? When you are the, in the leadership committee of your college and you have some, some specific objectives to achieve, you need to learn to make smart goals that are specific, measurable, and so on and so forth. So you need to learn to measure. How will you know when you will get there? Someone has famously said that when you don't have a goal in your leadership, you will certainly achieve it because whatever you do, it will not matter because you had no goal. But once you have a goal, it becomes measurable. For instance, you may plan that in 2021, by God's grace, we, our prayer is that we will witness the Christian fellowship on campus, will share the gospel with 20 students over this next three months. It's a measurable goal. And so that target, there's nothing spiritual about it, but the target gives you a focus so that you can now be praying, Lord, help us reach 20 students. And as you do that, as God answers and people are being reached with the gospel, it, it doesn't matter whether they're getting saved or not, but you are witnessing to them. Some of those are going to come to Christ. And at the end of the year, as you look back, you may see that we prayed to God to allow us to reach a uh, hundred, that's 20 in the next two or three months. But at the end of the year, we wanted a hundred. And then you'll be surprised how God begins to bless your fellowship. Let me tell you a story of one campus I worked with several years ago. They prayerfully prayed that in one academic year, God will help them reach 100 students with the gospel of Christ. And do you know that within that year, as they bore witness to Christ, they were able to reach more than 100 and more than 100 students on campus came to Jesus Christ. It meant that when they were praying every morning, they were praying for salvation of souls. As they went out of their classes, they reminded themselves, let's witness for Christ. As they did their weekend outreaches on campus, they prayerfully targeted every hostel and they made sure that every Christian union, even the fearful ones, are encouraged to witness. God blessed their work that was taken in faith and the target enabled them to have a vision 
and uh, rather uh, an intentionality. So the issue is measure. The fourth step is action. Once you have some goals that are measurable, you ask yourself, what do we need to do to get there? What are our options? And this is part of the leadership. You are asking, what are our options? If people are not coming to your fellowship, if one of the targets is that our Christians on campus do not attend fellowships regularly, you ask yourself, why? And then you begin to say, as a leadership, what can we do to make them attend fellowship? You see, those questions help you begin to think about solutions. And the solutions come when you collectively discuss these things. The, uh, I think we have done four. Now the fifth one is implementation. Once you have assessed, you're measured, you start, is the implementation. You get things done. Some of us sit in committees and talk all day. You meet next time, nobody has done what they're doing. Implementation is key. It is how we get there. We put our talk into action. And that's an important part of the planning cycle. And the sixth and final step is learning to evaluate. Are we there yet? Is there another way to get there? Do we need to go further? Those six steps are important steps in the planning cycle. And remember, I started by saying they are clothed in prayer first. Why is it important to plan? Because if you don't have a plan, you will not go far. For instance, in our fellowships, we have fellowships, and sometimes we invite speakers. Some fellowships on campus have this mindset that they don't give speakers topics. They just say, come and speak as the Holy Spirit leads you. Now, I know that the Holy Spirit can lead. I know how many times the Holy Spirit can put a word in, in the speaker and they can come and speak. But do you know that even every letter that Paul wrote in the Bible was in response to questions that were being asked? So for instance, when he wrote the book, the two epistles to the Corinthians, some brethren from Corinth had come to report to Paul that there were problems in the fellowship. Some of them were creating disunity, for instance, in chapter one, some of them were claiming, I belong to Paul, others to Apollos, others to Cephas, others say that they belong to Christ. So the fellowship was divided. So when Paul the apostle wrote the book of 1 Corinthians, one of the issues he was addressing was unity in the fellowship. So it was not random. The Holy Spirit works through the questions and the problems we have. So as we plan our fellowships, we are leaders. Let us give speakers topics that address the needs of the fellowship. And the Holy Spirit will help the speaker find content in relation to that topic or a passage that will help us to be built up in Christ. So the fact that you are giving speakers topics does not mean you are not spiritual. No, the Holy Spirit worked even in creating scripture from responding to problems or questions that existed in the fellowship. I hope that you're understanding where I'm coming from. I know that in some of our church traditions, speakers are not given topics. And you may find that because of that, these good topics are, are being uh, brought to us. But the issue that as students on campus, we need to be careful that we are helping our students to be disciples in all aspects of their faith. So that in your topics, as you plan, there's a time that we will address prayer. We are to, going to talk about fasting. We are going to talk about the Holy Spirit. We are going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. We are going to talk about evangelism. We are going to talk about how to face crisis like COVID. We are going to talk about giving or tithing. We are going to talk about how to study, how to be a good student. So you see, the topics that we have help us to become balanced Christians. The reason why many Christians in our continent are imbalanced is that there is no clear purpose or strategy how we are addressing their needs, even in our church fellowships. So as a result, we can hear the same topic week after week, and you can go through 
church for 10 years and you'll never ever hear somebody talk about work ethics. You will never ever hear somebody talk about how can we be stewards of the earth that God has given us. I visited one country in Africa and was surprised to discover that the way people dispose their rubbish is by throwing it into the river. That's how they dispose their rubbish. So you go to this city, the capital city, it is full of rubbish, plastic bottles of all kinds, shapes and sizes, tins, papers, boxes, shoes, old clothes, handbags, suitcases. This community believes that the way to keep your environment clean is to put all that rubbish in the river. Let me tell you, if it is not for God's mercy, that city is waiting for disaster to break out. Because first, it's a place where disease, when it catches, it will wipe out that community. Secondly, the children who run around will be exposed to danger. It's a place where also pests hide. So if, such, if Christians lived in that city and they are spending time praying to God for God to heal them from their sicknesses, what God may be actually telling them, clean your city. Because by cleaning that city, first of all, they'll eradicate 60% of the sicknesses in that city. So do you see the way God works? He has called us to be the stewards of the environment. And it is made perfect through leadership. I hope you are beginning to realize that leadership is so important. There are some things God does not expect to be answered through prayer. He expects them for you to work with your hands that he has given you so that he can bless that work. And as a result, you are going to prosper in your work. There's a place for prayer. There's a place for planning. That's the point that I'm trying to make. So as an effective fellowship, uh, I know that there could be many questions and I hope that we'll have some time to ask uh, some of the questions. For an effective fellowship to function, first of all, I said that we pray. Secondly, we engage in planning. I've given you an example of a planning cycle that we, are, we can uh, adopt to our fellowship or to our church, if you're a church member, or even to your workplace. You can adopt these principles and bring about change and transformation. The third thing will be budgeting. I know that some Christians don't believe in budgeting, but let me tell you, there's a place for budgeting. I wish we had time to go through the book of Nehemiah to see how Nehemiah meticulously planned for the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. He was called by God, given a vision, and the way he went about it, by the time the task was undertaken, the work was completed in only 52 days, which was unbelievable that even their opponents and their enemies could not believe that people who seemed so weak could rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Budgeting shows that we want to use the resources God has given us to accomplish the most. I want to invite you, if you don't have a personal budget, take time, go and do some homework and come up with your own budgeting. If you are a Christian union leader, let me tell you that it is really mandatory that as a Christian union committee or a Christian fellowship, you have a budget. A budget is, shows realistic expected sources of income and items of expenditure. And therefore, as we serve, we work towards a budget. A budget does not remove faith, but it is making us stewards of what God has given us. Fourthly, we learn to work as a committee. There could be so much we could say on budgeting, but time will fail us. But let me tell you that I want, if you want to pursue more details on the area of budgeting, uh, one of these days we can talk about it or your staff can help you or even many associates, especially those who did uh, comm uh, commerce or accounting, they can help you draft budgets. And budgets are so powerful. I can tell you story after story of extraordinary things that through the fellowships and even the churches I've led, we have been able to do things that were beyond us, but through careful budgeting, God caused our faith to arise and we were able to do exploits with the little that God had given us. The fourth and the final thing for effective 
uh, functioning in the uh, in the campus fellowship or in your church is working as a committee. And most of you, if you are leaders or if you will become leaders, you'll work as a committee. Committees can be frustrating if there is no clear sense of direction and assignment of duties. But when it works well, you can achieve a lot. Let me just show you five aspects that are important when it comes to a committee. First of all, if you are a committee member, you need to have a job description. A job description defines your role so that there is no duplication or competition. If you are a secretary, you should have a job description that tells you what your role is. Hopefully, it includes taking minutes when you meet. Maybe it includes correspondence with speakers. Maybe it includes keeping records of the fellowship. Hopefully, it also includes maybe making announcements or notices in the fellowship. That tends to be the role of a secretary. A chairperson will chair the meeting and provide overall coordination of the team. They are the main spokespeople of the committee. If you are treasurer, you look after accounts and there are many other roles in the committee, but job descriptions are important. It also helps you to know when you need to delegate. That's another subject. Uh, the second aspect of a committee is learning to work as a team. Some of you are in committees and you spend time fighting each other or gossiping about each other. You will not be effective if that's how you work. A team is that you cover each other's weaknesses, you complement each other where one may be lacking, you share ideas together, you vet ideas that come so that collectively you are making decisions. Let me tell you that teamwork is based on unity and unity is a very important aspect. In fact, the problem that faces most churches is this, is lack of unity. And that's why churches keep splitting and splitting and splitting because there is no unity. In the passage in Philippians that you will see in the first section that we didn't cover that I recommend to you, you will see that Paul emphasized to the Philippians the importance of unity. And so I pray that God will help you learn to work as a team because it is the biblical model built out of the Trinity of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one, fully united, yet with separate responsibilities in the Godhead, a mystery that even we can't explain in human words. Thirdly is communication. When we are in a committee, we learn to communicate. And in communication, it's, it's, it's a way in which we make things clear, what needs to be done. We talk to one another. And so I pray and hope that in your committee, you are learning to communicate because it builds trust. It makes lines and tasks to be done clear. And also it provides a very clear sense of what needs to be done. Communication is key. And those of you who are aspiring to be married one day, uh, because you are students, you are not quite there, you will discover that the secret of every successful marriage is good communication. Where there is poor communication, it brings so many problems. And it's the same in our Christian fellowships. Remember, we are talking about leadership. And your leadership will not be successful if you have not learned to communicate clearly. And communicating is not the same as talking. Some people are talking, but they are not communicating. You need to learn communication because communication is not just saying, but ensuring that it is being understood. The fourth aspect of, team, of, of a committee is confidentiality. Sometimes as leaders, you'll have to discuss issues to do with members that are sensitive, that are pastoral. Maybe somebody has fallen into sin. It is important that issues discussed in confidence are kept confidential. Don't make them prayer items in the fellowship after somebody has confided in you secretly. Confidentiality is so important in a fellowship. And then the fifth and final thing in a committee, it's so important 
uh, that you learn to affirm each other. In, in affirming each other, in affirming each other, you actually allow each other to grow in strength. We are all different. And sometimes it is easy when we work closely with each other, we can hurt one another. But when people do things and sometimes they don't do them well, you know, we are learning, we are students. You may find that you, you make mistakes, but it's so important that we learn to affirm each other when some things are done well, because it provides motivation. Remember, nobody is paying you to be a leader, especially in church or in the Christian fellowship, but affirmation builds confidence. It takes away our fears of failure and it makes us into better people. So let us learn to affirm one another. When people do wrong things, we can correct gently, but when they do well, let us affirm. Let us say thank you to them. In conclusion, I would say, to make a difference for Jesus in our campuses and church and community, we need leadership with a vision. Vision involves understanding God's call, God's purposes, and a willingness to obey the Lord. Vision is cast by the leadership, is the, is the role of the leadership to actually cast vision to the fellowship to understand where God is leading us and our plans and even activities we are going to undertake. And it is vision that allows the leadership to implement things with a very clear strategy. Prayer is central to what we do, but it is not an excuse for not planning. So I pray that tonight, as we have quickly and briefly walked through some of the key elements of leadership, I hope that you will appreciate that leadership provides influence, and that's why God has called us. These basic tools that I've shared with you will be a great blessing to you, not just in your student days, but later in the work years. Even today, I still apply them in my very own situations, both in church and in my roles. I sit in several boards. I sit in several committees. I, I sit in the senior leadership of many of my uh, places where I work. And I've come to discover they are basic tools, but they are so important. I use them in my own personal life, in my family. We budget, we plan. We try and invest a little bit so that God can stretch the little that we have. And that comes even right where we are students. We learn these things. Sometimes, sadly, in our churches, we don't address these issues. But if we did, we would be so much better Christians who will create impact in our society. And it starts where you are. Whether it is in Botswana or Zambia, when we start to implement these things, let me tell you, even our country will change. When one day you are put in the mining industry or working in one of the NGOs or, or companies working in the mines, you'll begin, you'll bring in a strategic leadership of teamwork with clear job descriptions or whether you're in government or in business and you begin to create a major transformation because you are a leader with vision, with a strategy, with a plan, with teamwork, with a clear way to honor God. And remember, you are basing it on prayer. So allow me to stop there for today so that we can have more time, maybe to take some few questions that you may have. I've tried to be practical today because leadership is also about a lot of practical issues. I know that in your unique situations, there's a variety of things that you have. Maybe you're planning a, a, prayer con a prayer week or an evangelism outreach or even a concert. These tools and, uh, and ideas can be used to be strategic so that you're not just gathering for the sake, but there's a very clear purpose. So I don't know whether any of you would have a question 
of the sessions that we have been having. Today is our final one, the fourth session. And we agree that we are going to take a break for you to internalize, but we have not covered all topics of leadership. I was saying that, you know, I could do another six sessions and we'll still not have finished. But I just want to, this is just an introduction to say that, yes, we can do it and make a difference. And I pray that God will continue to use you where you are and you will grow in your leadership. Lead us grow and become even more resourceful. Any questions that you'd like to put in the chat that we can chat over, either for today and through the sessions we have been doing, uh, or practical examples I can give you even more. Uh, it's unfortunate that we are not in the same venue for us to talk face to face, but I hope that this is going to be useful to you as you apply it in your own situation. As I'm waiting for questions, maybe I'll make a comment on uh, uh, co uh, music concerts, praise and worship concerts, because I know that they are the most, perhaps the most popular thing among students after, after birthday parties. Uh, let, let me suggest to you that because concerts are becoming such an important part, if you're a leader or you're the fellowship or you're the music leader, I want to you to prayerfully think and ask yourself, why do you actually hold them? Because you need to have a clear purpose. Remember we said last week, our purpose is to declare the praises of one who called us out of darkness into, a, into his marvelous light. I would suggest that the main purpose of those kind of events should be, of course, if they are for Christians, is for worship, if they are, but you can also use them for evangelistic purposes. Therefore, you need to have a message, a sermon in those sessions that will challenge people because some people are attracted to the music, but they have never really given their life to Christ. We cannot miss those opportunities. So at the center of it is to help people know Christ. Then secondly, in your purpose of such nights, you need to uh, think carefully what Count kind of songs you are singing. There are songs that sound wonderful, but they are very weak on biblical content. So when you do things like that, let those songs be actually to bring glory to God and not highlight us as human beings. So you need to think about the words of the songs that we sing, even in our fellowships. Music is good. But you know that even the devil is very good at music. That was his profession before he was kicked out of heaven. So today there are so many songs moving around and some of them are not blessing God or magnifying Christ, but they are very good and they are very entertaining. So we need to think, what are the words of the songs? And then also you need to close such events in prayer because you never know how God can move. As the songs are being sung and Jesus is being lifted, Jesus is being lifted. He's able to draw people up to himself. He's able even to do miraculous healings of chronic illnesses as people raise up Jesus Christ in our fellowships. So they are serious moments. They are far beyond just simply entertainment. So having a purpose is so important, a clear goal, prepared through prayer, planned well with professionalism and excellence, and then God glorifies his name as Jesus is being exalted and as we adore God. There's nothing wrong in being happy and being, you know, having a good evening, but there has to be a purpose to what we do as Christians. That was one thing I just wanted to comment because I've been with students in many of the activities, and sometimes I wonder whether they really give thought to what they're actually doing. And sometimes they can, they can, uh, they can uh, get so excited that in the process, uh, things begin to, to, to fall apart. And, and, and therefore, it also matters how we dress, our worship leaders, brothers and sisters, our sisters. Sometimes we prepare for worship, but our attire, when we get too excited, can create a problem. So we need to think about how we dress. We may dress with some dresses that once you get excited, and you start jumping and squatting, it creates a crisis that we will not know how to handle in our fellowship. So friends, let's think, even our dressing will matter for God's glory 
it, you know, whether we are having clothes or not, that God is not bothered, but it is us human beings who are bothered. So we need to be careful about the people we are amongst, especially our praise and worship teams. I know standards have fallen. Decency used to be an issue. Nowadays, style has become more important. So let's think about our fellowships because music is so central. How are we conducting ourselves? We are not being legalistic. We are just being stewards of what God has given to us. And you don't want yourself exposing what you shouldn't be exposing because it will, dis it will, it will shame you and it will also dishonor God. Any, uh, I'm seeing that we are having no questions tonight. Uh, that is fine. Okay, last week there was a question that remained. What would be the best and most effective way to formulate prayer groups that would encourage student leaders, staff, and associates to pray together? What would be the best way and most effective way to formulate prayer groups? There, I, would, I could give various suggestions. Uh, one of the ways that I think I found helpful that I've done with students several times is to encourage intercessory prayer for the world. And so you can plan that over this next, you know, once a week or once a month, you can gather together, focus on a particular country. Somebody needs to do some research and share some information about a country. What are some of the needs? and actually pray for the salvation of these countries. This is what we used to do when I was in high school. And you know, we used to have the world, the prayer maps of the world, and we would lay hands on countries we couldn't even pronounce. And it's amazing that today, many years later, God has given me opportunities to enter some of these countries to share the gospel with them. So that is something we can do. The other thing you can do is in your prayer meetings, some people who have not learned how to pray, first of all, we can train, do a training session, how to pray. Don't take it for granted. Some people have come to Christ from places where they have not been taught. So you can teach people, what is prayer? What are some of the forms of prayer? How can we be effective in our prayer life? What can aid our own prayer life? And there are things, examples like that. You can read, recommend books that you can read. E.M. Bounds has written several books on prayer that if you have not read, I want to encourage you to read because it will make prayer come alive. Prayer is not a shopping list. It's a lifestyle of communion with God. And when you begin to understand prayer, that it's not just being locked in a pint where everybody is shouting, it's a place where you're communing with God. It will transform your prayer life. So you can teach about prayer, but then also apart from putting them praying for the world, when you have your prayer meetings and split people in smaller groups, if you give prayer, specific prayer items from which you need feedback, you can find people uh, become more effective. In one church, uh, in the church I was, I was leading at some point, we started, you know, praying one hour of prayer before God. You know, some people find prayer such a tedious thing. But you know, if you go before God for one hour and for every six minutes, you focus on a variety types of prayer, you'll find that when you cover 10 items, one hour is gone. So you come to a prayer time, you spend the first six minutes in adoration of God, for which you can read, you can come up with, there are lots of verses in the Psalms, especially where God is being adored for who he is. Then the next six minutes you spend in thanksgiving for what God has done. You can thank God for your family, for your food, for your clothing, for your shelter, for the fact that you are a student, for your friends, the fact that God has given you gifts. Six minutes is such a short time to just give thanks for things that God has been good to you then you can worship God just for who he is. It's linked to adoration, but maybe you can spend in music. So quietly, you're just singing some songs of worship to God for six minutes. And then you move into a time of praying for your petitions for another six minutes. Let me tell you that once you break your prayer slot into those time slots, you begin to find that prayer can be done so much easily. 
So you, you also spend some time in confessing our sins. And if you find six minutes is too long, then get 12 items for five minutes and you'll find that you're able to cover more ground. So sometimes we need creativity. Once we grow in prayer, we'll get to a point when you don't even need those lists. You can be so tuned to God and lost in prayer that you don't even notice time is going. You begin to really pray in the spirit. And part of that long intercession usually is that you are not praying for yourself. If you're the kind of person who in your prayer time, you're only praying for yourself, no wonder you are struggling because prayer should actually be mostly praying for other people. And as you pray, you'll find that God begins to bless you with the very prayers that you're praying for others. And remember that also fasting comes with prayer. So the other thing is that you can also combine it with fasting because fasting is a way in which you empty yourself of the things that sustain you so that you can have a focused time on prayer. So prayer is so powerful. It's so uh, uh, wonderful. A, a, a fourth example, I think I've lost touch of how many I've given. A fourth example, I used to pray with three other brothers when I was a student on campus. For the two years we were there, we used to pray once a week. Nobody else knew. The four of us would pray for one hour. I, no, I think it was one and a half hours or two hours every Sunday morning. I even forgot it. I think it was one, two hours every Sunday morning at 4 a.m., because we used to have Sunday services. And our, the, the reason why we agreed to pray together is that one day when you don't feel like waking up, somebody else will wake you up. You know, there are times that you may not feel like because they have now made blankets that are very warm. So it becomes a problem when it comes to getting up for prayer. Once you're under that blanket, the only thing about you think is sleeping. So now that God has given you wisdom, you get some prayer partners who, when you don't feel like praying, they will come together and pray. And you know, we used to pray once a week and our main prayer was for revival. That was the only prayer we are praying. And what we were doing, we were prayer walking. So we used to walk around the campus, across every classroom, across every hostel. We, only, we never entered the ladies' hostels because it was a very ungodly hour to enter the ladies' hostels. But we walked around it but we, our prayer was for revival. Do you know, two years after we left campus, when I revisited the campus, I saw how God had actually been answering our prayers. People were coming to Christ on that campus in large numbers that could only be attributed to God hearing our prayer. I can tell you now because it's years ago, but it was a secret we were praying. And God can plant a prayer heart in you and we need more people to pray for revival. You know, come, uh, we, we experience revival on campus that pe there's a time people are getting saved every day. Some of them were being woken up in the night and they were looking for Christians to pray for them. So God answers prayer and we need to become more prayerful in these days in which we live. So just be creative and allow God to use you. But if you struggle, find a friend that you can pray with. And, and if you are prayer partners, I suggest that such intense prayers, brothers should be on their own and sisters on their own. You are all young people and I've found brothers who choose a prayer partner with a sister and then they hold hands to pray. And it has, uh, it has led to other issues that time will fail us to talk about here. So let's be wise. And when it comes to even issues like prayer, prayer can be a spiritual thing, but we are also flesh. Once you are holding hands with a sister in a locked room to pray, there have been other results where the body gets tempted as and, and beyond uh, prayer. Right. I think that brings us to an end to our sessions. And all I want to encourage you that God is fighting for us. And God knows our needs. He hears our cry. And he has called you into a leadership role. I started by saying four weeks ago that there is a major, major need for leadership. There is a leadership crisis at every level, church level, national level, political level, in our Christian fellowships. Are you willing to stand and be counted? It's not about your greatness, but the greatness of the God you serve. And as you put your hands in the hands of God, 
What God will require of you is integrity, vision, and prayer. And you'll be surprised how people will be drawn to you as you honor God with a life of integrity. And the name of Christ will be honored. And once you have done well in one role, the Lord will give you other roles and you'll keep rising. It's not about how loud you are. Some of the most effective leaders are quiet sisters who don't even have a strong voice. But what do they have? They have diligence. They have integrity. They have a teachable heart. They have humility. And God uses that to bring glory to his name. And with time, he'll also give them boldness that they can stand and speak before crowds because they have learned to commune and abide in Christ. May the Lord bless you as you continue to serve him in Botswana, in Zambia, and bring glory to God through his help and your obedience. Let's close in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you for the dear ones who have listened. I know it's not easy to listen to a monologue, but I pray that you are going to quicken their hearts to become leaders of influence who will be able to go into places in their fellowship, in the church, in the community, in their classes, even in businesses that you'll open for them. And that as they apply principles of leadership and influence through vision, strategy, aims, planning, budgeting, and even working effectively in teams and committees, that they'll bring glory to your name and that, Father, the fellowships will flourish because they are being nurtured with wisdom, with stewardship, with care, but also with prayer. And I just want to pray that, God, for those who may feel weak, that you may encourage them, that they can start small, and as they take baby steps and keep each other accountable, that we are going to see leaders who are actually making progress in being strategic planners who are organized, who are visionary, and who are godly. May your blessings and peace rest on these dear ones this evening and this coming weekend, even in the midst of COVID that is so devastating at the moment. Lord, we pray for your protection. We pray for your deliverance from COVID. We pray that you may uproot it from our midst. But Lord, meanwhile, help us be careful. And Lord, even provide leadership to so many where there is carelessness. We commit ourselves into your hands now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Over to you, Kachi. Amen. Um, um, good evening once more. So at this point in time, I'll allow Bright to, if there are any notices that need to be made before we, we close. Okay. Um, I think I would like to thank you all for participating. But I will ask... Um, and to stand um, and to speak for us and uh, to thank the new and the team from the summer as well as uh, the other members from justice. And to my time. Um, right, I didn't get you very clearly. Can you repeat yourself? I uh, was saying that I'll ask you to to appreciate and for uh, Peter, the male from Botswana, as well as the other team from Justice for attending the team. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, Azafes would, would, would love to appreciate you, Uncle Peter, for, for your time. I know it's not easy to, to have us on your on your program for these past four weeks. But I also appreciate the fact that you, you have answered the call of God to just come and bless us. I know I, I came in late today, but uh, uh, I've been there for the past, uh, uh, the other sessions that we had. I personally, yes, it was training, but, um, it was also more like a sermon, uh, the word of just coming and, and blessing our, our, our lives. So we, we, we really appreciate and uh, 
we we hope we can organize something like this in future and pray that the lord to just give us time once again to be blessed by your your ministry i would also love to to, to say thanks to, to our team from uh, Botswana. Um, this is the benefit of technology that we can we, we can interact like this. Uh, I think probably in the future would would would, would love to 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 engage uh, uh, brothers from from other brothers and and sisters from other regions as well. But we really appreciate your your company and your your involvement. Thanks a lot. And the, the other associates, uh, probably a couple of them are not here today, but uh, I would love to say thanks to them for, for, for the support and uh, uh, for just uh, supporting the students uh, during this training. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you, Angel uh, Milton. I think I can hand over to the other person now. Right, we can hardly hear you. Um, I was saying thank you to um from Alekan. I'm handing over now to you. You can take it up. All right. Um Sister Neil, a word of thanks from Botswana. Mrs. Otole. Sakala. We can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um Thank you, Zephyrs, for the invite. We we have been learning a lot for welcoming us in your platform. Uh, like Malekani said, I think technology has been saving us so wonderful. And we are hoping that even in future we will get the invite. And by the time we have something in ICMB, we will also have you around to learn with us as well, to teach us as well. So thank you for having us and the rest of the team from Botswana. And likewise, since they say Uncle Peter, I will also say oh. Uncle Peter. Thank you, Oyuku, for, for your availability time and again, because anytime I, as ICMB or the Zafas call, you are always ready and available to serve us. We don't take it lightly and we pray to the Lord that he, he bless you and increase your wisdom for the glory of his name. Thank you. Thank you, Nell. Clever, representing the students. Clever, are you there? Okay, it seems like seems like the students don't want to talk. Um, Oh, you're breaking clever. Your network is bad. No. Is that yeah, we can hear you, but you are breaking. No. So, on behalf of everyone, yes, clever. Um, okay, then, because the network is bad. 
Uh, maybe the okay, issue can help me on now. my idea. You can talk now. It's fine. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Uncle Peter, and uh, thank you to everyone who attended uh, in this particular training. Uh, if I'm correctly informed, today is the, the last of this training session so that people may have time to reflect on it. We have uh, videos on YouTube. We'll take time to properly title them according to the week, the way they uh, came in, so that uh, you just have time to reflect on them. And then after some time, we'll, we'll have another training of this manner. But for this time around, let us reflect and implement. Uh, as we have heard, those who've been taking notes, uh, thank you very much. For those who will go back to YouTube, uh, thank you very much. Shall we close in prayer? Our God and our Father, we thank you for giving us this wonderful opportunity to meet uh, on this platform. Thank you for each and every person who has found time to be on this uh, Zoom call, starting from the first week up to this week. Our God and our Father, we pray that you may give us grace to implement the knowledge which we have learned from uh, this training. We pray, O oh Lord God Almighty, even for the grace to teach others the things we have learned. In Jesus Christ's name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Uh, Amen. Till next time. But I think uh, the group can still remain up. Amen. Okay, so the group will remain active so that you can share your reflections, your questions, and everything. The group will not be closed. Thank you. All right. All right.